What's up, everyone? Welcome back to Conflicts of Interest. This is episode 144, and I'm the host, Kyle Anzalone. On today's show, I'm interviewing retired U.S. Army Major Danny Shurgin. Danny is a writer at antiwar.com. He's published several books, including Patriotic Descent, uh, the link to Danny's website with all of his different credentials and everything will be in the show notes page. He is a veteran of the U.S. war in Afghanistan, and that's mainly what we're talking about on today's show. But he's also a scholar and was a former West Point professor. So Danny's a very smart man. He's one of the most prolific writers in the anti-war movement. And with his on-the-ground experience with the Afghan war, he's able to provide such a great level of insight. This is really one of my favorite favorite episodes of the show and I think everybody is going to really love this interview. Before I get to the interview, I just want to ask people to share this episode wherever you're listening to it whether, you know, you, you click through on Facebook or something like that, hit the share button, Twitter, MeWe, if you're listening on YouTube, hit the share button there. Uh, or at the Libertarian Institute where the show is hosted and that's where you get the full archive of the show libertarianinstitute.org/kyle. Uh, you can support the show at Patreon or Subscribestar or by doing your CBD shopping at Paloma Verde. Look, I know a lot of people that use CBD for a variety of reasons. Uh, for some people, it helps them get to sleep. For some people, it helps them to relieve pain or anxiety. And everybody has their own form of CBD they like, whether it's gummies or soft gels or topicals you know i'm a fan of the topicals i talk about a lot on the show but i know a lot of my audience already uses cbd and uh, i just want to tell everybody they should really check out paloma verde for their cbd products they, they have high quality products there you could look at the lab tested results and they have a wide variety of products i really think their selection matches just about anywhere else i've seen and so think about giving them a shot and uh, you could get a nice discount when you do that by using the promo code peace p-e-a-c-e when you check out that's paloma verde cbd.com promo code peace all right now let's get into the episode Hey, Danny, how you doing today? Doing great. Thanks for having me on again. Yeah, well, I'm excited to have you on today. Usually, I feel like I have you on to talk about more of your scholarly type, scholar type work. You know, uh, we're talking about Ethiopia or Mali, or where you know all the history of these wars and what's going on in these countries. You break down the regions and the ethnic groups. But today, I want to talk maybe more about a little bit of your personal experience, someplace you actually have been, uh, Afghanistan, as... I, you know, some people are saying the war is ending. And so I, I thought maybe that would be an interesting place to open the conversation, which is from your perspective, is the war ending? Because in some ways, it seems like the war is significantly changing. However, I say that there's a war going on in Somalia. And it seems like, you know, the level of activity the US is going to have in Afghanistan is going to exceed what we have in Somalia you know, well after August 31st. So I'm interested in your take and also, you know, what it means for the war to end. You know, if the war is ending at all, only the U.S. phases, and I don't even think that's completely true, right? So I'll, I'll, I'll dig into that. But I think it's important to keep in mind that Afghanistan has been at war, literally at war, since at least 1979, really around 1973, when the first rumblings of sort of a uh, regional and Islamist insurgency against the government, you know, began at like a low level, but at least since 1979. So we're talking 42 years, right? Um, you know, uh, a baseball player who was born when the war in Afghanistan started, you know, it has retired already. It's a long war. Um, so no, the war's not ending in any sense for the Afghan people. Now, on the American end, so that's one of the things that's interesting is like Americans are so America centric or Western centric in their views. We did this in Vietnam too. Um, we call our engagement in Southeast Asia, the Vietnam War, right? That's what historians call it. That's what popular culture calls it. In Vietnam, they call it the American War. And the reason they call it the American War is because it's really only one phase in their war. Because first they fought the Japanese, then the French, um, 
then the Americans, and then throughout the whole time, the South Vietnamese government, but also in Cambodia, and then China invades, you know, soon after the United States leaves. So like, the, we're just one phase in the war. The same goes for Afghanistan. You know, there was the insurgency against the king and then the early communist government. Then there was the anti-Soviet sort of Mujahideen crusade. Then there was the civil war of the 1990s between the various warlords, many of which the U.S. had funded and empowered, in many cases still does. Then there's the American phase of the war. That phase may be ending, kind of. <laughs> and I think one way to start that is to poke holes in the narrative that the American war is just over. Uh, and it, and what that means to me is that there are so, there are several unanswered questions that I'll just throw out there and then we can dig into whichever ones you want. But unanswered questions. What will the role of the CIA be in Afghanistan after we leave? By the CIA, I mean it's actual agents. It's kind of sources and informants and proxies on the ground. And the black SF, and I don't mean black as an African-American, I mean the terminology of folks who are kind of in the military, but kind of not. Um, they're sort of the, the uber secretive side of the American Special Forces, and they blend into the CIA's increasingly large paramilitary element. Uh, what will their role be? Well, unanswered question. Uh, open question, I should say. Another one, airstrikes. That's drones. That's fixed wing that's piloted, manned and unmanned, basically. Um, we've seen an increase in some of the bombing. Uh, will there be increased pressure for the United States to up its airstrikes as, as the Taliban continues to succeed, basically, in its offensives? Another unanswered question is, what happens if Kabul is threatened or a few more of the major cities? Will there be, well, we know there'll be major domestic pressure on Biden to maybe go back in or re-engage or send troops or whatever. Um, but will he give in to that? And by the way, part of that open question is the extent to which, as it always does, the domestic political calculus, the domestic political situation here in America will influence Biden's ultimate decision. Another open question is the embassy. <laughs> Uh, there's basically an infantry battalion's worth of Americans military staying there, about 600, four to 600, depending on what you read, staying there to guard an embassy. Uh, quick little note, if you need four to six, if you need an infantry battalion's worth of people to guard your embassy, like probably there's a problem in that country. Maybe you don't want to have an embassy there. Um, what, what role will that play? Uh, will that become the launching pad for infusing new troops in if, uh, you know, if, the Taliban starts to really kind of move on Kabul. And then I think the last one is the proxies. Um, that means the warlords, the militias that are mostly ethnic militias, Hazara, Uzbek, Tajik, which are the main northern and western groups uh, in, in northern and western Afghanistan. To what extent will the United States, whether through the CIA or through the Pentagon, help fund those individuals? Uh, and what effect will that have? And will this break down into civil war? You know, that map of the ethnic groups of Afghanistan that you have there is very telling. You know, I've said before, a picture tells a thousand, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. I think a map is worth 10,000 sometimes. Um, you know, the light blue is the primarily Pashto. And they are the plurality, or at least the largest group in Afghanistan, but there's a whole bunch of others, uh, ethnic, ethno-linguistic groups. There's also some religious differences in the case of the Hazaras, who are in the center of the country, I believe they're the orange, um, who are mostly uh, Shia. So there's a lot of unanswered questions, and I think that that, just the fact that those open questions remain, oh, oh and one I forgot, big one, contractors, mercenaries, what about them? Uh, according to the vague deal with the Taliban, they're supposed to leave too. Any contractor who's paid by the Pentagon to do anything, whether it's provide security, kill people, or just fuel Afghan army uh, helicopters or Afghan Air Force helicopters and planes, um, or just serve food, they're supposed to leave. But there has been talk, right, that one of the things that might be done 
is a little bit of bureaucratic gymnastics. So what we'll do then potentially is transfer who pays those contractors to be the government in Kabul. Okay, that might be the loophole that's necessary, but it's kind of disingenuous because the government in Kabul doesn't have the tax revenue to even pay its own police and soldiers. We fund that along with some other donors in NATO. So we would essentially be paying the Afghan government to pay these contractors. Uh, Taliban is not going to take very kindly to that. Their view is going to be this is disingenuous. This is just, you know, uh, kind of like some trickery, you know, like some voodoo in order to, you know, maintain them. So all those questions remain unanswered. And because those open questions exist, I think it raises serious, broader questions about whether the American phase of this war really is ending or not. Right. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad you laid all that out, Danny. I guess one of the things that it seems to me from the Biden administration is uh, maybe not everybody is on the same page or they don't have this all 100 percent figured out yet. You know, as you point out, we have this infantry battalion guarding the embassy in Kabul and eventually maybe they're going to have to answer the question of what are they going to do if uh, you know, rockets start coming near that embassy or the Taliban starts taking territory near that embassy. I suppose, you know, there's ways that the U.S. could diplomatically negotiate it to keep that embassy in place and find some way to coexist with the Taliban. Uh, but at the same time, we have our Secretary of State, you know, Antony Blinken, saying that the Taliban will become a pariah, it, Afghanistan will be a pariah state if the Taliban take control by force. And so that sounds to me like the U.S. may be looking for a maximum pressure campaign or something like that. Um, I guess I'm curious uh, uh, if you have any ideas on maybe who in the Biden administration is or do you think like Biden himself really is trying to end this thing? And it seems like the airstrikes have really ticked up since the command of the war has shifted from Afghanistan in the Bagram Air Base, where I guess it was General Scott Miller uh, to now General Kenneth McKenzie, uh, the head of CENTCOM. Uh, th that raises a lot of interesting questions. Some of them are unknowable, but we can uh, we can guess and we can sort of uh, extrapolate a bit. So I, I think, and this is just an opinion, I do think Joe Biden himself, instinctually, gut player, all that stuff, really doesn't like the war in Afghanistan and hasn't for a long time. In the Obama administration, he was pretty good on this. Well, he was the best as far as they went, you know, in terms of the primaries, the top tier inside the administration. You know, as early as 2009, he's telling Obama, do not surge. You know, Barack Obama is the first black president, a supposed liberal, a supposed anti-war guy who gets the Nobel Peace Prize. But he tripled the number of American troops in Afghanistan in his first year. George Bush couldn't pull that off. You know, I mean, that was an enormous escalation of this war. Um, Biden was against that. You know, I've been critical of Biden on almost every single foreign policy issue in his entire career. And I've been told that because I do that, that I therefore love Donald Trump and hate all minorities or something. Like, it's crazy the amount of, like, backlash you get when you criticize a guy like Joe Biden. So for me to say this is not because I'm a, a Biden bro, but on Afghanistan, I think he's been pretty good. Right. I don't trust the people around him. Um, so far, he seems to have, like, Put, held off against a lot of the pressure coming from things like the Afghan study group, which is full of generals and war industry shills, you know, uh, he held off pressure from folks like that who were advising him to stay. But you do have people like my friend and yours, Jake Sullivan, you know, uh, as his national security advisor, who is more in the Clintonian mold, the interventionist mold. He's also a mind melder. He's also very good at being close to the throne, you know, and pleasing his boss and being what his boss wants and making himself indispensable. So I don't know what he's doing or saying. What I do know is he and his ilk are more prone to arguments about staying, maintaining what they always call a residual force. I can't stand that phrase. I mean, it's just, that's just another way of saying like small forever war rather than big forever war. I mean, it, it's... I don't know what's happening inside the administration. There's been a decent amount of discipline in a certain sense compared to some of like what was going on in the Obama administration. Like there hasn't been quite as many leaks. There have been some. Um, 
there were those reports that were coming out from certain sources that you know we were going to maintain some sort of force there that we were going to maintain um a high degree of airstrikes and then there were some corrections kind of put out by the spokespeople at the white house saying no no, no that's not true so it, it does so we don't know exactly what's going on inside but i will say that this could be bit a bit of biden against the world uh even inside his own administration and yeah he's the decider but he is nothing if not a political animal. Um, he proved that with the Iraq story earlier this week when he said, we're ending combat operations, but dot, dot, dot. Actually, the troops are pretty much staying. We're just going to reclassify them as advisors and trainers. On Iraq, he's been terrible. On Afghanistan, he's been pretty good. So in some ways, this is in line with his instincts. But I think his administration is full of people who are uh, more inclined to the Hillary Clinton worldview of how we should handle a problem like Afghanistan than to his own view instinctually that may not be highly thought out, analytical and intellectual, but is generally correct in its instincts. And and ironically, this is an issue where him and Donald Trump aren't that far apart. Right. right. I actually wanted They're to ask perfect. you about that because I was thinking that as you were saying it and in one sense, you would almost think Biden maybe has a leg up on Trump here because Trump, I you know, I think people calling him an idiot is maybe too dismissive. I mean, the guy became president like he he has some abilities to do some things, but I don't think one of his skills was navigating the American bureaucracy whatsoever. Yeah, I, I people in his administration were people who opposed him running. Right. Uh, it, like never Trumper types. John Bolton ends up with a position. H.R. McMaster ends up as his national security advisor, where Biden at least should see this coming maybe a little bit like it, But that maybe depends on what his cognitive abilities are or and, and also maybe Trump, you know, brought in some Red Tillerson type figures, which weren't, I don't think, as much of a swamp creature as, let's say, a Jade Sullivan. Not that, you know, he doesn't end up bringing in like Mike Pompeo eventually, but still, I think there are some uh, swampier creatures that came in with Biden uh, that, you know, maybe Trump didn't bring in all the the Bush people. But it is very interesting that Bush and our Trump ends up with the neocon problem. And now it seems that Biden has the Clinton problem. Yeah. So Trump comes in with a neocon weight kind of like tied to his leg, you know, weighing him down. And Trump comes and, and Biden comes in with a neoliberal problem and of course like they're not that different when it comes to an issue like afghanistan they're just not um that's interesting that's an interesting analogy um you know mark esper pompeo bolton hr master these guys are problems they want to stay in afghanistan forever or they're willing to well biden has a lot of people like that around him as well the clintonian types both of their instincts are kind of correct but i think that biden does have a bit of a leg up one of them is he gets a better shake from the media. They are, every day you open up the newsletter that comes to your inbox, in my case, and in many people's cases from the Washington Post, the New York Times, you know, for my sins, and I just like see what they're writing about. What is the establishment writing about? What are the opinion columnists and the guest opinion columnists writing about? And every day the stories on Afghanistan from those two major papers are about the same. They're chicken little, sky is falling, America leaving is the biggest disaster like oh my goodness they may say it overtly in some cases they may imply it in others they do that with Biden but they're less on the attack of him personally they hint that Biden's decisions on Afghanistan to pull out might turn out disastrously but if it was Trump and when it was Trump they called him out by name and they implied that he was actually like in bed with the Russians who were putting bounties on our heads and that he was like rolling over for the Taliban. And, you know, they were questioning him personally, like his character, his level of treason, uh, the implication. So Biden gets a better shake from the media. Biden gets a better shake from Congress largely because the thing about Joe Biden is that he has some loyalty from the left, obviously, vaguely defined, from the Democratic Party. But the, ex- the to the extent that they still exist, like the leftover sort of like moderate establishment hawkish Republicans, they also don't hate him all that much either. I mean, they may like make a show of it and say things, but he knows those guys and he knows how to navigate the Congress. Now, his cognitive ability 
um, always remains an open question at his age and some of the strangeness that's gone on. But it seems like, unlike Obama, he's been able to like push off the generals a little bit. Obama got steamrolled by his generals. Fact. Biden warned him about it. The insider accounts have said that Biden said to him in 09, like, don't let these guys push you around. They're going to give you three options and they're all going to be bad. And they're going to say these are the only three options. Don't let it do it. They may even leak some stuff. And they did, right? They leaked their plan saying like, and it pissed Obama off. Like he, he was kind of like Kennedy where he afterwards, he was like, felt like he'd been duped and was like, hey, you know, you got to be careful with the generals kind of thing. But at the time he got steamrolled. Biden seems to have avoided that. And I think it's partly because he has, uh, he gets a better shake from Congress and he gets a better shake from the media. Trump was doomed. The best thing that Biden has going from him on Afghanistan is that he's not Trump. Like Biden's allowed to end the war on Afghanistan. Like he's allowed to at least kind of end the war. Uh, if Trump does it, he hates America. He loves the Taliban. He's doing Putin's bidding. He's an idiot, right? He doesn't understand anything. I think that, that, you know, Biden's number one asset on a number of issues, including Afghanistan, is that he's not Donald Trump. And that raises some serious questions about the American political space. So uh, uh, before I move on, because I do want to get into, like, the media coverage of it and what they're trying to do to, to change the narrative to get us to stay, I want to ask about the Afghan military. One of the things I thought that was really disingenuous that Biden did during his press conference is he was like, we spent all this money, we built this, or we should have built this great military and state for the Afghans, and if it falls apart, it's their own damn fault. You know, stupid people can't manage their own stuff. We set it all up for them. Perfect thing. And, uh, you know, these idiots didn't listen to the training. They came in and they botched everything. And so if the state falls apart, you know, it's, it's not the Americans' fault. But it, it seems to me, Danny, that that's uh, that, that can't be the case. And so it, it may be very soon that the Biden administration kind of has to ad address or uh, at least acknowledge that the Afghan military is falling apart. I think from the most recent uh, SI AGR, the, the Special uh, Investigative General for Afghan Reconstruction Report, he says something like only 37% of the helicopters are functional. And I'm guessing there's still like, or at least pretty recently, was some American help maintaining those helicopters. So what's going to happen when apparently all the American contractors leave? I mean, I heard reports that they're talking about taking these things to Qatar to repair them. I mean, that right. seems absolutely absurd. I look at a map of the Middle East. That seems like a long way to move a helicopter helicopter uh for standard maintenance but so what's the plan here i mean that the helicopter thing is one of the anecdotal and instructive pieces um turns out afghanistan is landlocked <laughs> always has been also turns out that it's really hard to win wars in landlocked countries where there's a safe haven across a border for the insurgents um Historians call that fortified compound warfare and have concluded that it's almost impossible to win those wars. America, though, isn't really big on uh, worrying about such things. We could do anything, right? But the truth is that in those kind of fights in landlocked, mountainous countries where the majority of the population actually lives in rural areas and there's a lot of remote districts that are being contested, the ability to do fixed-wing airstrikes and the ability to use helicopters to both move troops in and move casualties out and move supplies in uh, and, you know, move soldiers around. That's vital, just at a tactical level, right? Just to win the war, to even maintain any control over this vast and disparate country is going to require these helicopters and planes. Oops. They're completely reliant on American logistics and American contractors to do like the maintenance. So this whole idea that America is not complicit at all in the failures of the Afghan security forces is like utterly dismissive of Afghan agency, right? And just disingenuous. One of the problems is that the United States never really knew what it was trying to do. It could never really decide what it wanted the Afghan security forces to be. It changed over and over again. Uh, in the beginning, it was like, well, we'll empower the warlords. We'll like let them kind of like semi, you know, become official military forces. We'll overlook some of their war crimes and like ethnic chauvinism. 
then it was like, no, 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 we're going to create an Afghan army in our own image, you know, that looks just like ours. Well, you know, maybe the Afghan army doesn't need to look just like the United States military. Maybe it has a different mission. Maybe what it's for, right? You always want to ask question, what is something for, right, at, at root? Maybe it wasn't for what ours is for. I mean, if to the extent we know what ours is for anymore. And uh, we enabled a lot of the corruption, the ghost soldiers, the officers stealing uh, money from soldiers that are on the books but don't exist in real life. We turned our head to a lot of that corruption. And American advisors and trainers are not innocent in this. Afghans know how to fight, right? They, they're known for it. It's not just the Taliban. The people who are in the Afghan security forces, they are. I've seen them fight. You know, they're not all cowards or something. They're not just incompetence. The question is, what do they feel they have to fight for? You know, the, one of the problems with the Afghan security forces has always been one of legitimacy. Same thing goes for the whole Kabul government. The Taliban, for all their monstrosity that they often display, is fighting for something. They can tell their recruits, you are fighting and dying as the resistance to occupation and the resistance to the corrupt Kabul government, which is really just a lackey of the United States. That resonates. People will die for that. These Afghan soldiers, it's a little bit more mm, squishy because the Kabul government really kind of is an American stooge, American produced. So is the Afghan military. Um, they also realize that even after 20 years, they weren't left with the capacity indigenously, like their own capacity domestically to like run this thing themselves, to fund it themselves, um, and to be self-sustainable. And so they don't necessarily have the motivation, the will, or the belief that they can win, which is why we are starting to see some of these mass defections and mass surrenders. Because they just, you know, it's not that Afghans don't know how to fight and aren't willing to fight. It's just that they're willing to fight for certain things and not for others. They're not stupid. And uh, I think a lot of them see the writing on the wall. And they're more worried about protecting their own ethnic groups, communities, regional areas. And the Kabul government remains an abstraction that is tainted by its association with the United States. Right. So uh, just, uh, I guess, overnight or pretty recently, I saw it reported that the Taliban actually launched an attack on the capital of the Helmand province in Afghanistan. And so just, you know, again, looking back at this uh, ethnic map of Afghanistan for anybody who's watching the video feed here, uh, when we're talking about this area, it, it looks pretty heavily in the light blue area to me, Danny. And so... Mm -hmm. Is there a problem in Afghanistan getting people from the Hazara or the Tajik ethnic group to go to Helmand and, you know, fight and die for Lashkagar? And I'm guessing that if it's a problem there, it's probably going to be a problem like Kandahar, Farah, and all these heavily postured areas. Yeah, I mean, I was in Kandahar in the height of the Obama surge. Like, we had the top amount of soldiers. I was just southwest of the city out in, like, the, uh, like, literally out in, like, the hillbilly. Like, I was, I mean... Frankly, the part of Afghanistan I was in is like Hatfields and McCoys, like Appalachia. I mean, it, it was intense. Taliban was founded just miles from where I was working in, in, in Zari district in the in the village of Sangasar, which was the home village of Mullah Omar, who was kind of like the founder and the leader of the Taliban for the longest time. Uh, I always would say fighting down there was like we were fighting on a home on the, on the Taliban's home turf. It was always an away game. We were the Yankees coming into Fenway Park. It ain't an easy place to play, right? Uh, same goes for Lashkar Gar and, and, and Helmin, the, the two highest casualty provinces for American forces uh, among all of Afghanistan's provinces throughout the course of the war was number one, Helmand had the most KIA, most killed in action Americans. Number two was Kandahar. It was a big problem taking the Afghan security forces down there and having them not only be motivated to fight in these disparate regions, very far from where they usually were from, which is central Afghanistan if they were Hazara, um, north, uh, north central if they were Uzbek, northeast if they were Tajik. It was hard getting them to be motivated to fight, but also a lot of them didn't even speak Pashto. Like they needed an interpreter as much as I did. They had trouble connecting with the people because the people saw them as almost as much of an outsider as me. 
almost as much of an outsider as me. I told a one star, a one star general who came to visit me when I was starting this local police program. He was asking me about my quote unquote partnered Afghan forces, like the army guys that were on my base that I shared a base with. And I told him that. I said, well, you know, sir, most of the, I, I said it like he already knew it. I was like, sir, you know, uh, obviously most of these guys are from the north. A lot of them don't even speak Pashto. The people don't really connect with them. They see them as outsiders. And he was like, wait, wait, stop right there. What did you just say? And I was like, dude, you're the deputy commander of the entire southern Afghanistan, RC South province, right? Regional Command South. And, th and this is news to you? That, th that some of these guys need interpreters? That these people are from hundreds and hundreds of miles away and are seen as outsiders? Like, how? That was the obtuseness and the ignorance that largely ran this war. Not every one of our generals was that ignorant, but that happened. The guy was like surprised. And so I don't know that it's realistic that something like the Taliban wouldn't be popular in that region, some sort of Pashto majority military force. Another thing to keep in mind is that now Kandahar is seen as kind of Afghanistan's second city after Kabul. It's kind of like Chicago or something, you know. Um, but historically, historically, Kandahar was seen as the key heartland of what's now Afghanistan. To the Pashto people who live on both sides of the Duran line, which divides arbitrarily divides uh, Afghanistan from Pakistan. The British drew that essentially that, you know, half the Pashto essentially in the world live in, you know, that part of Pakistan right over the border. Half of them live in like Southern and Eastern Afghanistan. Um, to those people, to that large and partly stateless people in terms of not having like a Pashtunistan, they're kind of like the Kurds in that way. To those folks, Kandahar is, is the center of, of their culture, of their history and has been traditionally. So, Helmand, of course, is right next door and is also a big time Pashto heartland. I've always thought it was sort of unrealistic that we believed that the Kabul government could con maintain centralized control, you know, not devolved sort of aut autonomous status, but centralized state control over Kandahar and Helmand the same way that, say, the United States does or France or the Netherlands over its provinces. I always thought that was unrealistic. I said so 10 years ago when I was there. I was sort of laughed away. Oh, no, no, of course we can do it. We're going to win. Great. Well, we're not winning, uh, and I'm doing the fighting, and we're not winning. But now we're seeing that play out. I suspect that at best, Kabul's going to maintain for a while, I don't think forever, control over like Kandahar City, although districts of that are now being contested already. It's a big city. Some of the outlying districts are already being contested. And maybe Lashkar Garl, I think that'll be even harder to hold because it's even more distant than Kandahar is. Um, this thing's going to probably break down into a sort of uh, like a stasis like it used to be. It's going to end up like becoming like de facto partitioned probably in the short term. I don't know about the long term. I don't know if Taliban takes the whole country again almost, but essentially they were going to see the country divide along ethnic lines. The real disaster, the real nightmare scenario is that it breaks down into 1990s style chaos and civil war and anarchy among warring warlord militias, of which the Taliban is only one of the main players, probably the most powerful. If that happens, that's a tragedy for the Afghan people. And then we'll have to look at the American face as like a blip on the radar. Just just one more indecency, just one more warlord, this one headquartered in Washington, who came in to terrorize the Afghan people because they're the real victims. Uh, one, one quick question on that, I guess. Um, it, would there, I, I have no idea, like, can Afghan kind of divide neatly along ethnic lines? I know the Soviets uh, got into and made a mess. I've also seen, at least by the official statistics, the city of Kabul grew from like a population of half a million to almost five million over the course of the u.s occupation in that country and so i'm guessing that involves a lot of different ethnic groups being in one area and uh, so you know maybe historically kandahar was more central to the costumes but because the u.s has made kabul so important and now i think there's like costume warlords uh, that are in 
Kabul, uh, who's to say that that doesn't, I guess, just become, you know, the new center for the Pashtuns and they essentially own that city or something like that? Yeah, can you pull that ethnic map up, map back up real quick? Yeah. So the the short answer, and it's a really important question that you raised. The short answer to that question is no. There's absolutely no way to neatly partition. Um, there never was, and you're and you're right. It's even more complicated now that Kabul's become like a megapolis. You know, it's become like a mega city. Um, Kabul is like sort of a microcosm of all of Afghanistan because every ethnic group lives there. So. It also has Kabul airport. There's a lot of customs money to be, you know, uh, gained or stolen or skimmed off the top that comes through there. So all the different sides, if this thing breaks down, the Kabul government, the different warlords from the northern ethnic militias and, of course, the Taliban are all going to be fighting for Kabul. The Taliban is not going to be satisfied with a partition that doesn't involve them controlling Kabul. You know, for it, what it would really break down to is almost like more like a slice of Swiss cheese or something like it. When I say a, a de facto partition, it's not going to be a neat north-south transition. I mean, there's po- there are Pashtu, if you look up in the north, there are Pashtu who live with the Uzbeks and the Tajiks up there in the north-central part of Afghanistan. What are you going to do with them? Um, the Hazars are surrounded. They're in trouble. They're, they always take the brunt of it. I mean, they're Shia and they're like the Hazara ethnic group. So they hate them, you know, the... The Taliban, for example, hate the Hazaras because they don't like their ethnic group and they also think they're infidels, you know, or apostates is a better word because they're Shia. Um, That's a problem. The Tajiks, who I believe are, I don't know if they're the red or the, I don't know if you can tell me if they're the red or if they're the dark green, but the Tajiks will probably be able to hold like an enclave like they did as part of the Northern Alliance in the very like northeast of the country. Um specifically that one valley that escapes me where the that famous uh, warlord for the Tajiks kind of held off the Soviets for a long time and was able to hold off the Taliban. The Uzbeks, they've got like their fight, I mean, they've got Rashid Dostum, who's like the general former vice president and like basically war, cr- war criminal extraordinaire who still runs their kind of private army. But even they are scattered a bit. So it's not a neat country. This map is very instructive. No, it, there's no neat partition. I fear that this thing is going to break down into basically five and a half sides, which is to say, I think the Kabul government's going to hold on for a little while and still maintain some sway, but much diminished. So there'll be one party to the civil war. Taliban will be the strongest party. The Hazaras are already forming their own ethnic militias, which they've done less of than the other groups up till this point, but they're forming a bunch. Um, the the Tajiks are going to be a major player up in the northeast, and the Uzbeks in kind of like the north, central, and northwest. And then the half is going to be the United States wild card. Drones, CIA, proxies, contractors. One could also add another half, which would add up to six, which would be Pakistan and the ISI and the extent to which they try to weigh in. It appears they have less overt control over the Taliban than they used to. Taliban's a little bit more of a free agent, independent actor now. Uh, The ISI doesn't seem to have quite as much control over them. So they're another player. So at the very least, we're looking at basically seven players, right? You know, five of which are on the ground, hardcore in Afghanistan and two of which are external actors being Pakistan and the United States. It's a real mess. Uh, for anybody who wants that map, by the way, just pull out your copy of uh, Fool's Errand that I got from Scott's book. It's also on uh, foolserand.us, and there's a whole bunch of great uh, maps up there. But, Danny, I want to, like, maybe shift towards uh, the the arguments that are being made for the U.S. to somehow stay in Afghanistan, maybe even ramp up for some of these hots, but at the very least, don't scale back the war more than it already is. You know, keep up the airstrikes, keep up the support for the Afghan military. I mean, you, you know, you point out the U.S. is a half. The NATO pledged to give the uh, the NATO with U.S., so it's mostly the U.S., pledged to give them $4 billion a year for just for their military. That's not like humanitarian aid and every that's just for for the military so this is crazy but um i think the main argument that i hear is the poor afghan people 
are going to suffer so much for if the Taliban take over. And this, is, I guess, from what I could tell, the Taliban seem like somewhat horrible people. But you have to put somewhat in there because of the context of the region uh, that the Afghan government are no angels themselves. And so, I, I mean, is it a, a humanitarian catastrophe waiting to happen if the, the Taliban take over? Will it be not that there I, I mean, there's already been reprisal killings uh, re, recently. I think like the Afghan pilots are being targeted for assassinations. Um, I, I mean, ISIS course on factions in the country. They're not associated with the Taliban, but you know, they, they, they ruthlessly kill people. So just by the context of Afghanistan, how horrible is the Taliban? Well, they're pretty, they're, you know, they're, they're a pretty horrible entity and they have a bad track record, but the Taliban is like, it's not one thing. It's, it's not really a monolith uh, anymore to the extent that it ever was. Um, it's a conglomeration of different groups and interests. Some people are there, because they want money. Some people are there because they really believe all the Islamism and really want like, you know, an emirate basically in Afghanistan. A lot of them just hate either the Kabul government or the foreign occupiers and they see themselves as the national resistance. So they're nationalists, just like Ho Chi Minh was as much or more of a nationalist as he was a communist. A lot of Taliban fighters and leaders are as much nationalists as they are Islamists. This has always been true. Taliban are not the only bad actors. Warlords like Dostum have, you know, suffocated, raped, murdered, like, tons of prisoners and children. And, I mean, and one of the other arguments I always make to kind of deflate that whole idea that America is the only thing that's, like, keeping us from humanitarian, humanitarian catastrophe. That's basically four things I say to that. One, here's, a, here's something that's uncomfortable. In, like, 2018 and 2019, the Afghan government that we put in place and American forces killed more civilians than the Taliban, you know, in air and airstrikes and stuff. That's uncomfortable. <laughs> that's, that's awkward for that argument. Uh, the second one is like, that's not why we went in there in the first place. Let's just, let's not rewrite history. Like they try to do on the pages of the Washington post every day. Let's not rewrite history to say that America went to Afghanistan to help the Afghan people. America went to Afghanistan as what was seen as a political necessity to retaliate against the 9-11 attacks because bin Laden happened to be in Afghanistan. Because in 1998, 1999, and 2000, when the Taliban were like mass executing women in soccer stadiums, the United States didn't send an invasion force to go liberate the Afghan women. We always hear so much about women's rights, right? As if that's what brought us in. Man, we stood aside and we were like even secretly talking to the Taliban, you know? Like we were dealing with them back channels. And we certainly weren't sending an invasion into that landlocked country over women's rights. Right. And I think at the time, didn't they actually pressure the Taliban to cut down on the illegal heroin, which they were able to get the Taliban to do? Maybe they could have cut down on the public execution of women instead of, you know, being so concerned about the drug war. But it shows where U.S. priorities are, huh? It sure does. And of course, you know, the, the outcome has been that, like, the amount of, like, hectares of land that have been dedicated to growing poppy, like heroin, uh, has increased by a factor of 32 since 2001 so so much for the drug war turns out that the war on drugs is no more effective uh you know in in kabul as it is in kansas city okay like it's a it's an utter failure in both cases um maybe we should just drop the whole idea <laughs> maybe we should stop declaring war on things you know it seems right. like every time we mess it up right um but the other thing look <laughs> this whole women's rights and human rights another anecdote that deflates it is this idea of buggery. Yes, child rape I'm talking about. I mean, the bocce boss culture of raping prepubescent boys after you like get high on hash and dress them up as girls and put makeup on them and stuff and make them dance for you is a real subculture. I mean, it was before my eyes to a certain extent, right? Like not literally, but they talked about it. They invited me to these parties. The elders did. The official policy of the United States essentially or at least the de facto one, sort of unspoken but spoken, was leave it alone. Leave it alone. Because we, we can't alienate these elders because we need them to be on our side. Otherwise, they'll, they'll join the Taliban. And we need them to like convince people in their tribes to like join the local police or to join the army. So much so that when an American Green Beret walked in on a child raping and punched out the elder doing it, probably out of instinct, right? 
red-blooded American boy uh, who joins the military tends to think poorly of child rapists. So he right. may not have been able to control himself. He punches out, who gets in trouble? Who got in trouble? The Afghan elder? No. The Green Beret had his career affected and was reprimanded. I tell that story, and it was news at the time briefly, because it deflates all this disingenuous crap about how this was ever about the Afghan people. That is a canard. That is something that was thrown in later as justification. It's like when we invaded Iraq. I mean, you remember 2002 and three. They didn't say we have to save the Iraqi people. That wasn't much of the narrative. The narrative was WMDs and Al-Qaeda collusion. Well, as soon as Al-Qaeda collusion and WMDs was completely deflated and proven false, which was already false and people knew it, but after we didn't find any WMDs, that's when we started hearing about, well, no, it was still worth it because Saddam was bad. Well, we heard the same thing about the Taliban. We didn't go there to save the Afghan people. We use the Afghan people like we use so many people overseas that we don't really care about as a continuing justification for maintaining an occupation militarily. That's all they're for. These people who are writing these columns, whether it's Max Boot, you know, on the whatever neoconish right or any number of like the liberal hawks. These people who are writing about Afghan human rights, they never met an Afghan. If they did, it was on like a two day tour that was staged like a Potemkin village for them, you know, on a trip. They don't know Afghans. They never slept in their village. They don't give a crap about the Afghan people. They use the Afghan people from their comfortable offices to make arguments in favor of interventionism on behalf of a corporate media that is in bed with and sometimes sharing funding with a war industry that also runs the Congress, which runs them. I mean, I hate to sound all that conspiratorial, but this is just documented stuff. So I just reject that whole idea that, you know, we have to stay for humanitarian reasons. Hey, look, if, if nothing else, hey, so what? Should we should we, we should stay and, 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 and keep killing more civilians than the Taliban? How is that helping them? Uh, the reality is, as long as America is involved, we actually increase the recruiting for the Taliban. The best recruiting sergeant that the Taliban ever had was the Pentagon's occupation of their country. Right. Well, I'm sure another part of all of it is just uh, whenever you, you probably ship the time preference for people in the country. I mean, I'm sure the mental illness that you've inflicted, uh, you know, with especially the drone warfare on the children and stuff like that, the air war hovering up there all the time that now, you know, with all the instability in the country, um, it, it's, you know, capital investment. Uh, I read a while ago that one of the reasons that when the U.S. like built all those, uh, I think they gave solar pumps to a, a bunch of Afghan farmers in Helmand expecting that they would start to grow trees and stuff like that. But fruit trees take like five to ten years in, you know, good cases to start to bear fruit. Where, you know, the poppy, it's one growing season. It, it, it's ready to go after a year. So um, it, it seems like that has to be a, a major problem for the Afghan people going forward until the, you know, U.S. war in that country really ends. You can't even start to move back to a normal society because you're going to have a, a ton of terrible things that have to happen between the end of the U S war and, you know, just Afghanistan rebuilding itself and trying to, to get its, you know, own house and people in order from, you know, the trauma that's been inflicted on them. And again, that's not just a result of the Americans. It's not like the Soviets weren't there just before us and killed a hell of a lot more people than we probably did. But well, the what you're mentioning, though, that's so interesting is that Joseph Heller would have had, a, you know, the author of Catch-22 would have had a field day with this war. You know, I don't think he'd know where to start with the absurdities of it. Um, America was always barely treading water, throwing anything against the wall and seeing what would stick, just floundering, really flustered. I remember they were trying something similar in Kandahar. They, they, they had me, they wanted me to convince the local folks who've been basically growing either poppy or or grapes right and then drying them out basically as raisins um they've basically been growing those two main crops forever like forever like for the longest time then they were like no no convince them to to grow saffron we're going to create a new like saffron economy and i was like that seems like a bridge too far it seems like a bridge too far for me infidel white invader from you know 
8,000 miles away to come in and be like, hey, uh, I know the Taliban is pressuring you to like provide the opium crop to them uh, and that you need that money in order to survive and also that you don't know anything else and that your irrigation system is basically unchanged since the 14th century. But, uh, but I'm here now and I'm smarter than you and better than you because I'm an American. So just like grow this saffron, the profit margin will be great. Yeah, all right. That's crazy talk. It was crazy talk all along. And, and, and we saw lots of this. I remember they sent me a guy from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. They sent this poor guy down. This poor, And I was not to be trifled with at this point. I was a salty, unhappy, not give an F kind of captain. You know what I mean? My base is getting attacked every single day. My kids are dropping like flies. You know, I got a guy getting wounded while he's in the porta potty because they're dropping mortars on us every day. Like, I've got big problems right in front of me fighting a war against an enemy that I can't beat. And I've got drones. I mean, I, I, the amount of power in my hands was obscene. It's gross. I'm not bragging about it. It's ridiculous. I mean, just dropping bombs and artillery daily. Daily. My lieutenants were. Like, and this, they sent me this USDA guy and, and his plan – Poor guy. I don't even. I don't even hate the guy for it. Like he's doing his job. We're gonna build a model farm right outside your gate. That's gonna teach them to use like PVC piping rather than just the standard canals that get blocked and are problematic and you know prone to the weather in order to do their irrigation. And we're gonna like change this 14th century irrigation system to like this more modern system. And we're gonna build a farm that shows them how to do it. And then we're gonna tour all the elders through it. And it's going to be like an operational little farm, but it'll be like a small microcosm. And they'll all be able to learn from it. And I looked at the guy and I was like, okay. I mean, obviously the colonel sent you down here, so this is going to happen. Guy's got a big checkbook. And I'm, I, I don't know how I've written more about this. Like, I, I, maybe I just don't have the emotional energy. But like, so I'm like, okay, dude. I was like, that's great. But let me tell you what's really going to happen. I'm going to say, you got a couple problems. One is uh, you can't step outside my gate without getting shot at. Uh, you know, the other day, uh, on a patrol with my guys, I had to jump into a canal because we were under fire within four feet of the gate of my base and they attack my towers every single day. So like when you say right outside the gate, please don't think that that's a safe haven. And B, I said, what's going to happen is they're going to rat F your model farm and they're going to steal all the PVC pipe. I said, it'll probably last a week and it's all going to get sold off for parts. And it's going to be like a barren wasteland. That's a monument to our stupidity. And he was like, damn, you're salty. And I was like, damn, I'm right. And you can guess how it went. That's exactly what happened. Wow. And it's just a perfect example of the farce and the futility of American efforts to transform societies on the other end of the world with the military as the primary tool. Because they sent me a U.S. Department of Agriculture guy, but he can only operate if my soldiers put themselves at risk forming a cordon around him so that he can build this model farm. The whole thing was a joke. And it was a microcosm of a war that was a joke. And it's so frustrating to me that even though it's a funny story, it makes me want to like punch my hand through a wall. And that's 10 years ago. I mean, that's how I still feel. It's the absurdity of it. Yeah. So, Danny, I, I got to ask because uh, usually, you know, it's me and Will talking here and we're not vets. We've never been to Afghanistan. And if you read, you know, the, from people who themselves have likely never been to Afghanistan or you know, probably are in contact with too many soldiers themselves. Uh, I can say, you know, I do know several vets, uh, n not a ton of vets from the Afghan war, uh, more Iraq war, but I do know several vets. And uh, none of them has ever said to me, man, I hate leaving uh, these countries because, you, you know, uh, it, it means my friends died for nothing or anything like that, or, you know, any variation of that. However, People keep using that as something I keep hearing and seeing in the mainstream media. And so, Danny, I know you're, you know, still in touch with a lot of people. Are are, are they crying and saying that I can't believe this war is coming to an end? We, we did it all for nothing. And boy, I just wish we could, you know, stay for another five, ten years so we could really finish the thing. It's remarkable how little I hear that. Like... For the most part, you're correct that the people who are saying that crap are mostly not veterans, people who've never heard or delivered or dodged a shot fired in anger are the ones that are like lecturing the American people on behalf of us saying that we can't leave because then the soldiers died in vain. I hear very little of that from veterans. I hear some of it. There's always going to be some of it, but you'd expect a lot more. Most of my soldiers and peers and so some superiors that I'm still in contact with, and we're talking about scores of people that I really have maintained contact with, 
the vast, vast majority of them are not liberals, and they're not activists, and they're not public anti-war dissenters. Tiny percentage of them are. But I'll tell you this, almost to a man, and in my case they were all men, the kind of units I was in, almost to a man, they don't believe in the wars. They may not be like anti-America or say that we're an empire or say that we're militarists or want to take action or, or want to speak out publicly. Most of them are kind of apathetic and fatalistic about it. They're just broken about it. But no one ever talks about victory anymore. I literally cannot remember the last time I heard one of my soldiers or peers or former subordinates or former superiors, really, the ones that I stay in touch with and respect. Some of the superiors might still say this, but even most of them don't. I cannot remember the last time I heard one of them say, like, we got to stick it out because, you know, we might win it. A little more time. No one talks that way anymore. This is – when I was in Iraq, I learned about the nuances of the meaning of the term inshallah, which basically essentially means if God wills it, right? Um, I had thought that like inshallah was like a sort of a uh, – like a, a really like spiritual or religious thing to say. You know what I mean? Like it was like, oh, inshallah. It's, oh, they're they're very – they're very devout. That's why they say that. What I learned really quickly is it's just a phrase they use for everything. And you know what it usually means? Uh, it's it's like, you know, you ever see the movie Donnie Brasco where he's describing all the different meanings to the phrase, like, forget about it, you know, like the mafia phrase. Right. Inshallah yeah. was like that. And one of the things that I learned is the way that he uses it usually is they go, you'll say, like, are you going to be at that meeting tomorrow that we're planning? You know, they're not very prompt people sometimes. And they'll go, inshallah, like, if God wills it, like, maybe. What they mean is, like, maybe, but probably not. Or it's like very fatalistic. They'll be like, you'll say like, oh, you know, do you think uh, think we're going to win this fight tomorrow? You'll be talking to the Iraqi soldiers. And they'd be like, eh, inshallah. And it's very much like, probably not. Like, it's just, you know, it's going to go how it's going to go. It's not going to be great. reason I bring that up, if I had to summarize in a single term how 90 plus percent of the veterans that I serve with, some of whom don't have their legs, some of whom don't have their minds, really, all of whom have been affected by this. The one word encapsulation would be this. It would be the pantomime and the word, inshallah. They're just beat. They're just, they don't believe we can win any of this anymore. And the stats bear it out, where polling showed in 2020 that more Afghan veterans were against the war than civilians. More Afghan veterans want to withdraw than their civilian counterparts, which to summarize means that America's warriors, perhaps for the first time in history, America's warriors are more anti-war than America's civilians. Um, that is a story in and of itself that doesn't get enough coverage. Yeah. All right, Danny. Well, this has been absolutely great. If you have any final thoughts, you know, go ahead and say whatever you want. But if not, tell people where you, where uh, where uh, where to find your work. I know you put out uh, so more stuff that I could keep up with. Um, I think I probably read more of your articles than maybe anybody but you. Uh, but as far as like your butts and stuff, I do lose track in your podcast and everything. I do have the uh, the show with Scott Horton that you did queued up, which I'm really excited to listen to. So uh, what else you got going on? Yeah, so uh, you know my latest book is a history of the United States, which kind of like ties to the current wars and focuses on empire. It's called a, a True History of the United States. You can find it everywhere. Uh, my website skepticalvet.com everything that I do kind of conglomerates there and then if you check me out on Twitter at skepticalvet I'm always tweeting out my articles and appearances but uh, yeah thanks for having me on and giving me the opportunity to kind of uh, spread where to find me and uh, I'm sure we'll talk again next time there's a massacre in Africa or uh, you know something pivots in the Afghan war and at least today I didn't really make too many predictions except I guess I did make one that this thing's going to break down into an ethnic civil war let's hope I'm wrong uh, uh, because uh, every time I write, a lot of people die. <laughs> yeah, well, I definitely will have you back on the show again soon this week. There was news on Ethiopia, Mozambique, and Mali that I wanted to ask you about, and I was like, no, I've wanted to do this Afghan show with Danny for so long. Uh, you know, the the we're a month away from the April 31st, so I'm going to do the Afghan show, but we will get together for another Africa show again soon, Danny. Thanks so Absolutely. much. Thank you so much.